This is a fun map, and it's highly reminiscent of the StarCraft mission Eye for an Eye. However, there's only one easter egg I could find, a path through these trees by this village. One trick that's a good thing to look out for when easter egg hunting, especially on this campaign, is canopy trees. These are doodads new to the Frozen Throne that are pretty handy for obscuring pathing areas. They're essentially the 3D equivalent of those hidden areas found in many platformers where you go behind the scenery. This instance is pretty easy to find since the deciduous Ashenvale trees stand out pretty starkly against the coniferous lord on summer trees. In this clearing is a boy named Little Timmy who will sell Arthas ice shards. These 750 gold cost items summon ice revenants, which can be pretty useful. Now let me tell you a bit about Timmy. I actually made a mistake in the Scourge of Lordaeron video when I said, Whoever he is, you'll see him in a future level, so take note of him. At the time, I remembered there being a Timmy on this level who sold you ice shards, but I thought that it was this ghoul, not a child. It made more sense in my mind for a ghoul to be doing business with a death knight like Arthas, not a little kid. I was wrong, but my confusion has some justification. There are several different Timmies in Warcraft 3. There's the one in Stronbrad you saved from the Knolls, who actually makes an appearance in the founding of Durtar with his mom Alicia. Not sure where his other brothers are. There's this ghoul named Timmy you find in the crate in Anderhal, who may or may not be Timmy the Cruel, an elite ghoul boss on World of Warcraft encountered in Stratholme. There's the invisible child Timmy in the dungeons of Dalaran that we looked at last time, though obviously his role is just a trigger facilitator and was only named Timmy internally, so he doesn't really count. There's this child on the way to Arthas's concert who is also named Timmy. And of course, there's this Timmy who frankly doesn't make much sense lore-wise if you think too hard about him. A lone child selling ice shards to the undead? I personally think he's a goblin machine in disguise designed to use the appearance of innocence as a way to charge more wares. He's mechanical, isn't he? And in the game file, his voice is the same as a goblin merchant. Can I help you? Those sneaky goblins. Oh, and there's a penguin Timmy too, but we'll get to him later. Obviously, the explanation to this has nothing to do with lore. Concerning these discrepancies, David Fried, who made this level, stated, Timmy got used a few times because multiple designers ended up making the same references in different areas. Tim Campbell was the level designer who put the original Timmy into Warcraft 3, and another level designer, Dean Shipley, put the undead ghoul Timmy in the later level. The WoW Quest designers were not the same designers from Warcraft 3, so it's not surprising that things got mixed up, and thus you have Schrodinger's Timmy, who is simultaneously alive and undead. Arthas can score quite a few items in gold as he flees from what will someday be the Undercity. Most of them are fairly obvious to find, and the ones that aren't don't give very good loot, but this doesn't make them any less fun to hunt down. One of the first things I geeked out about when I bought the Frozen Throne was the elevator doodads, even though I'm not sure I ever got them to work very well on my own. I need to look into that, actually. There are a couple outside-the-box ones, though. One of the first you can access is on the other side of this elevator platform with the Pendant of Energy on the other side. If you get a meat wagon to destroy these walls here, you can get to the other side where you can find some gold coins and a potion of men. Definitely a lackluster secret if ever there was one, but oh well. Farther on, this Fountain of Health looks like a dead end, but if you creep up to the right, you'll find a path to a somewhat redundant Rod of Necromancy. Off to the east of this secret is a half-concealed Minor Replenishment Potion if you want it too. And finally, there's a scroll of regeneration in a barrel behind these trees here. You can have your ghouls or meat wagons knock them down if you really want it that badly. I think the thing that makes all these secrets so disappointing is that they're all consumable. I liked finding artifacts that you could keep with you for a few levels, almost as a memento of your discovery, but these may as well be used right here and now. Get my regards to hell, you son of a bitch. Possession. Possession everywhere. This is a unique map to be sure, being weak yet able to bolster your forces through possessing the leaders of the various creep tribes on the map is a fun mechanic to say the least, but it appears that this level used to have even more of this mechanic than it currently does. In the version we now play, you can possess the warlord of the ogres, Mugthor, to take control of the entire Stonemaul clan, and you can also possess the bandit ringleader, Blackthorn, a reference to the old Blizzard game of the same name, to enlist the bandits to your side. The two mercenary camps on the map are void of hires until you take control of these armies. Then they gain new recruit possibilities that say things like, We follow Dark Lady, pretty ghost, find enemies to kill, for Lady Sylvanas, when you hire them. 
You'll notice as you explore that there are other creep leaders around. Snarlmane the Knoll, Zulrog the Forest Troll, and the Puddle Lord of the Murlocs. Nothing happens to these creep leaders' armies when you possess them. Their own troops just turn on them and kill them, but judging by some missing sound files in the map, that wasn't always the case. Just like in every other scenario in Warcraft 3, every map's dialogue files are numbered by the order in which they're used on the map. There are a couple of sound files that are still used for the extra creep lords. You'll never get us all, witch. Chieftain Zulrog will hunt you down and avenge us. Back, you dead! No one trespasses on our territory. But there doesn't seem to be any real point to them other than giving the level flavor. However, judging by the numbers of the sound files, there are six troll sounds, five null sounds, and seven murloc sounds missing. I'll bet you anything that each of these armies was originally controllable through possession, and that these missing sound files are ones of Sylvanus and the respective creeps taunting each other, Sylvanus lamenting the creep leader's death without being possessed, and unique mercenary camp sounds like those of the bandits and ogres. There's only one sound file that is still in the map file but goes unused. That ugly toad is the creature we seek. Once we claim his tiny mind, his minions will serve our cause. Obviously, possessing and controlling five armies of creeps to march at Var Mothras, while cool, would have been daunting and overkill, so the devs obviously cut it down to just the ogres and bandits. Man, though, what I wouldn't give to have all of the original sound files for the dialogue in Warcraft 3. There are several missing in just about every map in the game. There's just one thing I don't understand about possession. Why does Mugthor still talk in oversimplified sentences and call Sylvanas a pretty ghost? Isn't he now just a banshee inside an ogre's body? Sylvanas says something about stealing minds, so maybe Warcraft's definition of possession is a little different from the conventional one. Haha, <laughs> Skull Snowman. Well played, Frost Trolls. Well played. On this first island, if you go up this hill and kill the Tuscar, you'll see a couple of penguins behind their base. The large one will drop a ring of superiority when killed. Later in the game, rather than taking the north path to the entrance to Ajol Narub, first enter the canopied forests to the south. If you take the west path, you can find a hidden scroll of mana in the trees. If you take the east branch of the path, you'll come upon the Penguin King. He'll drop a plus four ring of protection for you. The Penguin King is surrounded by piles of fish, but surprisingly devoid of loyal subjects. The scenario file indicates that this wasn't always the intention, though. There are two units, a Penguin Warrior and a Penguin Royal Guard, that both go unused in the unit editor. There's yet another Penguin Easter Egg in the Penguin Pen in the Tuscar Village to the northeast. Most of the penguins are normal critters, but one of them is named Little Timmy. He doesn't drop anything, and at a glance just looks like he was put there as a little secret for those who examine the penguins closely, but the triggers and map files say otherwise. In the item editor is an item called Little Timmy. Its model and interface icon are the same as the critter penguin, and its description reads, I am lost, help me. Timmy will make whoever is holding him wander around and run away just like a critter does. There are some disabled triggers that show that originally, if you brought the Little Timmy item to the Penguin King, a message would read, Little Timmy returned, and the Penguin King would reward Arthas with a circlet of nobility. It's not clear how you obtain the Little Timmy item, however. Perhaps the penguin in the pen changed into an item when you got close to him? Perhaps he was all alone somewhere completely different? Either way, the mini quest was taken out, presumably because it was in the dev's mind too cheesy, complex, or otherwise unnecessary. Personally, I wish Blizzard would have left in some of these really crazy, complex easter eggs. Maybe 90% of players wouldn't have even noticed Little Timmy, but those who did and realized he could be taken to the Penguin King in exchange for an item would have had a fun experience. The very essence of easter eggs is that feeling of discovery. Speaking of items, there's another unused item on this map called the Book of Beards. It has no special abilities, and it seems to be designed only to be purchased, since its only distinguishing data is its tooltip. This book is full of beard styles and trimming techniques. There aren't any shops on the map, and the Tomb of Relics you can build doesn't sell it, so I have no idea what its original purpose was. Maybe it was meant to be found to foreshadow that dwarves had passed through here recently? Actually, that's pretty likely now that I think about it. Lastly, Arthas has one unused piece of dialogue. This does not bode well for the Lich King. It is grouped with his other comments about the earthquakes. The devs probably just didn't want too many of them. Although it's a level with some cool city scenery and some funny parts, I believe his name was Garabon or Gilathos or something. Human names all sound the same to me. For Lord Gareth, uh... Who are we supposed to be fighting again? Dreadlord's Fall didn't have anything out of the ordinary that I could find, and a new power in Lordaeron doesn't have anything either, except for these fruit and vegetable stat- 
I mean, Lord Ron's city stashes. I missed them the first few times I played through this campaign because the level doesn't show finding them as an optional quest. I think it should have. This level does have one of my favorite cutscenes in it, though. I require one last test of your loyalty, Dreadlord. Do it. You wouldn't dare! It's a shame that they had to retcon Balnazar back to life in World of Warcraft. That was a really cool display of Sylvanas' manipulation powers. Over a demon at that. That basically went to waste. Doesn't anyone stay dead anymore? And seeing Garethos both killed and devoured by the ghouls is so satisfying. These three parts of the Ajol Narub dungeons are a veritable treasure trove of traps, puzzle rooms, and switches, which are all pretty fun. Unfortunately, they all have pretty obvious solutions. I wish these maps most of all, the final dungeon that takes three full levels to beat, had some more confusing puzzles that were a lot harder to piece together for the layman player. But the traps don't do a lot of damage, and others just take a bit of exploring and trial and error to easily pass through. As far as secrets go, however, there isn't anything in the first map. And in the second map, the only secret I could find is a circlet of nobility hidden behind the throne in this room here. The maps file has two custom units, a blue crab and a red crab that don't seem to have a purpose. Maybe they were going to be in this crab room and serve as some kind of secret depending on which one you killed first or something. See what I mean? They should have kept more trivial secrets in this mysterious place. There's also a broken trigger that talks about a fountain plate and an elevator. I wonder if this fountain was originally, I don't know, on a floating elevator and you had to step on a switch to lower it down to your level? Or maybe an elevator let you access the fountain? It's hard to tell since even the variables are broken in the trigger. It must have been a really early scrap. Defenses, Death Admit it, this is totally a Zelda fight. Those runes around the edges may as well be pots with hearts and magic jars in them. Except the boss isn't really fun to fight, nor very hard. And the door doesn't lock behind you as you enter, so you can just walk out and interrupt the action if you want to. Again, a missed opportunity in my opinion. There aren't many big boss battles in the campaigns, but this one could have been memorable with a bit more uniqueness added to the fight. I mean, flame strike? Why? Fight as you've never fought before! You mean like, without using any special abilities? Okay, I guess. The third section doesn't have any secrets, but I do have to say I'm very impressed with the triggers it took to operate the devices. The timed frost traps, the Indiana Jones-like treasure room with the weighted switches, this... fun area... This level definitely is a memorable and fun one that I always look forward to when playing through the Frozen Throne. So, I have a confession to make. To this day, I, Abelhawk, still have not been able to beat this map without cheats. It's the one level I've never actually won on my own. I know, I know. But it's partly because, as a kid, I really didn't want Arthas to win. I was fine with the lore ending here, with Illidan destroying the Lich King and the Scourge. I've always been in favor of the good guys winning in games. The only secret here is a big map mechanic that was taken out. You know those earthquakes that have been happening in Ice Crown for the past few levels? Those originally continued in this map, triggering every 45 seconds or so. Not only would they shake the screen and make a rumbling noise, they would actually do heavy damage to buildings in the area around the obelisks. I think this would have made it easier for me, at least, to beat this level. It was mainly hard for me to balance getting the obelisks and building up my base and fighting off Illidan, and all the while he's puppy guarding the obelisks he takes over with almost cheater-like skill. Preventing the obelisks from being viable areas to build towers on would have added an interesting level of strategy to the map. I see why it may have been taken out, though. It probably made the game a lot longer and more frustrating. Like a game of Monopoly. Obelisks. You know, come to think of it, the victory condition on this level doesn't make much sense to me. Couldn't Arthas just hide by one of the bridges until Illidan activated all the obelisks and then run across first? Even when Arthas does get all four first, he and Illidan both seem to get there at the same time anyway, making the entire struggle pointless and come down to a one-on-one -on -one duel. Oh well, a pretty epic end to an epic campaign either way. And that does it for the Frozen Throne campaigns. Thanks so much for all your support, views, likes, comments, and shares. I'll make sure to make one more video about all the secrets that I'm... What's this? Well, well, it seems that I was wrong. There are some Easter eggs in Rexar's campaign. And it seems I forgot about the rest of the levels in the Exodus of the Horde, where Thrall recruits the trolls in the Darkspear Islands. Let's look at those next, shall we? I'll see you then.